his followers and explained that in order to be a good person and go to heaven, you must love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. One of his followers asked, who is my neighbor? To help everyone understand, Jesus said, once there was a girl walking on the side of the road, when all of a sudden, a mugger came. <laughs> the mother beat her up, leaving her wounded and unable to move on the side of the road. Soon after, a well-dressed girl noticed a wounded girl. OMG, a homeless person. Please, let me take a selfie. Okay, you don't tell you're really bad Hashtag hang with the homeless. <laughs> Later on, another well-dressed girl who was on a call walked by the wounded girl. Instead of helping her, she pretended to ignore her and continued walking. Sorry, what was that? I thought I saw something. <laughs> then came the third Unitarian girl. <laughs> she immediately rushed over to help her. Oh my gosh, are you okay? Wait, let me call 911. Does anyone have a phone? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Please send an ambulance to BUC. <laughs> Thank you. Don't worry, help is on the way. Can you see it? Out of the three girls, who was the women's girl's neighbor? Sabrina? <laughs> Sabrina? Or Holly? Yeah. Holly! That's right, Holly was a good Unitarian. That's Jesus' <laughs> answer, too. We should all go and do the same. And now it's time for you to go to class. Thank you for listening. Spirit of life and love, we are here because we believe what we do matters. We are here because we believe how we live our life matters. That with every act of kindness or meanness, courage or fear, love or hate, we are weaving the fabric of the universe that holds us. We are here because we need encouragement, because we need strength, because so often we get distracted, we get in a rush, we don't think, we choose the easy way, when the harder path is what our spirits truly long for. We are here because none of us is perfect, but together we inspire one another to try again, to take another step. We are here because we have felt the stirrings of love and grace in our hearts and hands, and we crave more of it. For ourselves, and not only for ourselves, but for everyone. We are here because how we live matters. Blessed be.
flaming chalice, the symbol of our faith, the binding symbol that burns in Unitarian Universalist congregations every Sunday morning and in the homes of its congregants. Our symbol is built around two religious archetypes, the chalice and the flame. The chalice has been used in the Christian faith to celebrate the Eucharist, and in the Jewish faith to hold the blessed wine that is drunk during Sabbath meals. The flame, a symbol for an ancient Persian faith, Zoroastrianism, uh, symbolizing the wisdom of God, and in the Jewish faith, where the near to need is always lit, representing an eternal flame. The flaming chalice is rooted in the Second World War, as people in Europe frantically fled their homes for fear of imprisonment or capture by Nazis on the basis of religion, the Unitarians established the Unitarian Service Committee to help people in danger. It was led by Reverend Charles Joy, who ran into the enormous problem of trying to get people who did not all speak the same language understand his message. To combat this, he hired Hans Deutsch, an Austrian refugee who had fled from his home to France because of his political cartoons criticizing the Nazi regime. <coughs> Hans created a logo to help be able to easily identify those who were there to help. He brought together a chalice and a flame, which became the logo of the Unitarian Service Committee and permitted them to speak a universal language of love, peace, and hope to those who needed it most. According to Pamela Baxter, a director of religious education of a congregation in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and author of A Cup of Light, children lit chalices and classes long before many adult congregations adopted the practice. Symbolically, this, contributed, this contribution helped unite the newly merged Unitarians and Universalists. We adopted the logo in 1976, and thus it became an integral part of UU services. The youth, youth of this religion have made a massive contribution to Unitarian Universalism one that re represents our very core, the symbol of our faith. Our symbol was created by an immigrant, fleeing persecution based on his criticisms of an impressive and powerful force. And in his courage to speak out, our organization was able to help people whose lives were in danger because of their religion. <coughs> Religions that too were built around chalices and flames. We may not gather in communion to take in the Eucharist or bless our feasts, but we too gather in communion around our chalice. Ours is a communion of people who gather to wish happiness and strength to those whom, with whom we share our faith and the flame. To many, a symbol of the light and goodness found in God. For Unitarians, the flame is a symbol of an ever-present faith, a faith in something that might be as small as a flame, but as great as the light it creates and the holiness that it represents. Good morning. Good morning. I am, my name is Sarah Arnold and I'm a member of the high school class. There is passion for the flame in our chalice, and within each individual is another independent flame of our own, filled with our own unique passions. We strive to keep both flames burning bright and everlasting, but oftentimes it can be difficult to uphold the dreams, commitments, and energy needed to kindle both of these flames simultaneously. After a while, it will get harder and harder to keep the chalice flame strong within. It might dwindle once, and then twice, until all that's left are hot coals burned out. It takes a strong wind to light the fire again. That wind can come from a family member who encourages you, a congregation member that helps you, a quote from someone that inspired you. Whatever it be, that strong wind ignites a passion, reformed from lost dreams, that slowly start to come back from struggle that turned into an exciting new challenge. When you find that passion again, the easiest thing is to start, but the hardest thing is to keep it going or we could be back to the same problem again. That's why we need to persist. But how do I persist when church is only on Sundays? Luckily, we as Unitarians have seven principles that we can use as guidelines in our daily lives to keep this chalice flame strong and upheld. The first, we acknowledge the inherent worth and dignity of every person, even the people who spill sugar on the coffee table in the social hall. <laughs> We've got to stay strong together. Second, 
We must keep justice, equity, and compassion in each of our human relations. Don't get too mad at the sugar spiller. Assume they had best intentions. Third, to <coughs> now, as a congregation, we accept each other and encourage spiritual growth as a congregation. We need to support each other. Fourth, for each individual, there's a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Find a passion that creates a spark within. The fifth, we must work together to create a democratic process within our congregation and community. Six, to create a world of peace, liberty, and justice for all, you as a small spark that contributes to the flame can make a difference by fighting for justice. Speak out against racism, against bullying, against wrongful doings. Take these small steps. Taking these small steps allows us to work together as an interdependent web, striving for an improved world, principle number seven. These seven principles are words to live by. Keeping the flame ignited means our passions stay lively, keeps us thinking about what we could do better, and helps us to have courage and strength to enjoy life. So look around, help those who seem a little dim, work to make sure the flames are burning in all of us. It takes support from others around you and persistence to uphold passion for the individual as well as the channel's flame. We make up this we make up this flame as the flame holds us together. Martin Niemöller, a Lutheran pastor who spent seven years in concentration camps in Germany, wrote, "Firstly came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. In 1964, in Queens, New York, a woman by the name of Kitty Genovese was killed, with 38 of her neighbors watching. Only two of them made any efforts to contact authorities, and they did it after she was already dead. Another case of fatal complacency was in 2006, when Hugo Alfredo Talayax, a true good Samaritan, witnessed a woman being robbed at knife point and stepped in to help her. Hugo was stabbed and left to die on the sidewalk while the woman got away. Many passerby just kept walking and even took photos. Again, no one contacted the authorities until Hugo was long gone. Do you think you would have stepped in to help? According to statistics, the answer is probably no. In 1968, Bib Latain and John Darley conducted an experiment on what they later called the bystander effect. They placed participants in a waiting room and let smoke seep in under the door. Participants who were alone got help 75% of the time. However, once the participants were in the room with unmoving actors, placed by Latain and Darley, only 10% left, and they took twice the amount of time to get any help even if that meant that theirs and others' lives were in possible danger. Another fact of the bystander effect is that if you witness someone having a heart attack, you will be more likely to perform emergency aid on them if you are the only witness compared to if you are in a group. When in a group, one's sense of responsibility <coughs> is diluted, and you will wait for someone else to do something about it. Just like how Martin Niemöller implied that he was waiting for someone else to speak up and help the people being persecuted. In today's world, Martin Niemöller's poem repeats itself. Instead of the socialists and the trade unionists, it is Muslims being gunned down in their own places of worship. It is children being ripped from their families and locked in cages. And it is innocent, unarmed black men and boys being shot by police and nothing being done about it. Although the groups of people being targeted have changed, the system that allows this discrimination has not. If we don't speak out for them, who will be left to speak for us? The tragedy of life is not in our failure, but in our complacency. Not in our doing too much, but rather our doing too little. Not in our living above our ability, but rather living below our capacities. These words were spoken by Benjamin E. Mays, American civil rights leader and Baptist minister. Throughout human history, where there was civilization, there was conflict. 
dating back to the earliest of times, tyranny, war, and injustice rampage cities and towns. But when people thought that they were being, being treated unfairly, they did something about it. Human history is shaped by uprisings, revolts, and protests. Whether it be peaceful protests, like the Montgomery bus boycotts, Gandhi's salt march, or the march on Washington. Sometimes, the revolts were violent, like the Ferguson riots or the Stonewall riots. We, as human beings, strive to be treated with respect, fairness, and equality. And when those rights are infringed upon, it is our duty as citizens to do something about it for the good of our country, society, and world. As you use, it is our second principle that we need justice, equality, and compassion in human relations. The symbol of our chalice was created during exactly those circumstances and provided love, peace, and hope to a people persecuted solely for their faith. If we did not live our values, if we allowed the oppressors to make the decisions, we would not be where we are today. We need action. We need a willingness to walk out of these doors because if we don't, then who will? We as an open-minded faith have always fought for the growth and change in our society. We need that fight now more than ever. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center's <coughs> intelligence report, after a huge decline in 2014, there are now 1,028 hate groups here in the United States. There are 31 active hate groups in our state of Michigan alone, and in Southeast Michigan, there are nine. We see examples every day of ways our administration tries to take away the voices and human rights of oppressed groups. Bigotry is real. It exists in our schools, workplaces, and communities. When the rights of our, of our friends are infringed upon and their voices are silenced, we must live out our sacred principle for justice and equality. We can look to leaders like Benjamin E. Mays, Martin Luther King Jr., Tanahasi Coates, Harvey Milk, Malala Yousafzai, Angela Davis, Harry Hay, and so many more who have laid the groundwork and inspired us to eradicate intolerance and hate. But we don't have to look far to find inspiration. We have it right here in BUC. At our church, we have a social justice committee that is working towards equality in education, hunger, homelessness, racial justice, and safety in our community through reducing gun violence. Within our social justice committee, the Green Sanctuary is a dedicated group of BUCers helping to save the planet for me, my generation, and the generations to come. We live in the age of technology and information. There are ways to get involved. Simply putting a pride flag out on social media can show a young kid that they are accepted and loved. You can go to a rally or a march. You can stand up for a person whose pronouns are being used incorrectly. Raging Grannies is an association that you can sign up for and sing songs in protest. All these things require little or no money, only the fire of commitment. If you don't have time, you can still support groups that need funding to fight hate and intolerance. Groups like Human Rights Campaign, a group dedicated to protecting LGBTQ plus people's rights or Black Lives Matter, people fighting for racial equality. Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Give what you can, whether it is time, money, or letting someone know that they are loved. My family does a little of all three. We joined BUC in their support of SOS. We have attended the March for Our Lives rally. We have packed food for blessings in a backpack. Among my peers, I have called out bigotry when I saw it. Even when it's a little thing, it is important. We support causes that we believe in. I personally believe in the work of Southern Poverty Law Center and the National Parks Foundation. Our chalice has always stood for love, peace, and hope, and it will always stand for that. In the wise words of Rianosu Satoro, individually, we are one drop, but together, we are an ocean.